you, Linda. That was great. All right. A couple things forgot. Remember, I forgot to mention. Continue to remember Dan and all his treatments. God will bless him in that. Also, if you didn't get a chance, men, didn't get a chance to get your uh, Bible promises for men, a little gift we had for all the men last week, please come up and, and pick one. We want you to have one. And uh, let's see. Also, we had some birthdays this week. In fact, Rocky Aldridge's birthday is today, so we want to send him a happy birthday note. And then somebody had a birthday Friday. I think, who was that? Is that Avery? All right. Is she here? All right, let's sing happy birthday to Miss. Anybody else have a birthday this week that we didn't know about? Let me know. We want to celebrate. All we're going to sing. Y'all ready? Sing to Avery today. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Y'all ready for your riddles today? All right, these are Valentine kind of riddles. And they're probably worse than ever before, but this is the best I can do. All right. Okay, this is for the students. What is your math teacher's favorite, uh, uh, favorite figure? Is that right? Favorite. Shape. Favorite shape. What's your math teacher's favorite shape? Favorite what? Shape. Shape. What's your math teacher's favorite shape? Come on, Patrick. Come on, John. John, don't you all know this? Your favorite, their favorite shape? Of course, it's a cute triangle. All right. All right. One last one. Uh, what did Robin Hood write to his sweetheart? What? What did Robin Hood write to his sweetheart in her little card? I want to steal your heart. That's good. That's probably better than what I got. All right. Anybody else? He wrote, I sure would like you to be my Valentine. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me share with you uh, what 1 John 4.10 says before we head on out. 1 John 4.10 says this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Everything's based on God's love. He loved us first. And uh, that's how we know His love and His grace. All right. I think uh, kiddos are heading out, and Miss Emily, and take any of the teenagers who'd like to go out for, for Bible study with them all. Teenagers and children. All right. Everybody else, grab your Bibles. And we're going to begin to look at some aspects of love. It's a little bit different than we have in the bulletin, what God's love reveals. But uh, I want to look at a, something kind of got my thought span going this week as we had a Bible study. I don't know if it was this Sunday night or, or last Sunday night. And I think it was Terry asked it, made a comment or something talking about people becoming hard-hearted, unresponsive to God. And then this past week when I put out the Bentley Chronicles, if you ever watch those, uh, I looked at it, the, uh, some people that turned away from God. And uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 32, and we're going to look at them today. And, um, and I thought about why people do not love God. Or specifically, why do people become hard-hearted or cold-hearted toward God? Now, two verses we're going to look at today. One is, is uh, John chapter, we all, well, we don't maybe don't assume everybody knows, but most people, if they know anything in the Bible, they know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the passage I mentioned uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 32, when uh, the people turned against God in the wilderness. And in the message translation, it translates it this way. God said about the people of Israel, he said, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. They're trouble. And how do we become that way? How do we become hard-hearted? 
And the two simple things I want to share, but go in a little more depth, is one, we become hard-hearted toward God when we simply turn away from Him. When we turn away from Him. And, and when we do that, it leads to destruction in our life. But the great and the simple answer is, all we have to do is turn back to Him and we can be restored. It's that simple, but it's that more complicated. I remember reading the story of a lady by the name of Nancy Sando. And she had a lot of health problems throughout her life, and, and they didn't know exactly what was wrong with her. She always overreacted to pain. Now, of course, your pain is your pain. If it hurts, it hurts, right? But she always seemed to have a greater response to whatever happened to her. We all get cut or bruised or injured. And not only that, uh, her body just didn't respond in the same way. In fact, after a while, they began to discover when she would have some kind of injury, a cut or a bruise or something, on the outside of her skin began to feel like bone. And they couldn't figure out what in the world that was. And finally, a doctor saw her and she, he told her it is a disease called F. O-P, a bunch of words standing, obviously those are its initials, F-O-P, words I cannot pronounce. Another term for it is stone man syndrome. And a guy named Gary Patton back in 1692, just a few years ago, he discovered what that was. It was an illness. And what it is, is your body overreacts to something. Whenever you have a cut or something, your body jumps in and wants to heal it. Uh, isn't that a great thing? Uh, that's a God-given thing and a blessing. But they, their body, when they have an injury, the body just goes crazy trying to take care of that. And what it ends up doing, it calcifies things. Instead of just healing the skin, it makes it bone. And it obviously becomes a horrific problem. Now, that is a physical illness. But you know, there's a spiritual illness, and that's what we're talking about today. And that is a calcification, not of your bones, not of your skin, but of your will. You become stubborn and strong against God. And as I read in Exodus 32, 9, God looked down on the people of Israel, and he said, what a stubborn, hard-headed people. They had become calcified. They'd become rebellious against God. And how do we become cold to God and unloving toward God and turn away from Him? And, and the answer is that uh, we become like the people of Israel. We become stubborn and we become hard-headed. Now, a little background and uh, uh, where they were in Exodus chapter 32, they are in the wilderness. And what is the time frame? It is three months since they have left Egypt. It is three months have passed. They're now in the wilderness. They have escaped Egypt where they were slaves. And uh, God had delivered them. How? We remember looking at those ten plagues that God brought on the people uh, of Egypt. And it was everything from hail to the Nile being turned to blood to darkness from noonday to, to midnight. And eventually, the last plague, which finally set them free, was the death of all the firstborn. God sent those plagues, and that delivered them from uh, Egypt. And then when they went from there, God guided them to the promised land. By day, there was a, a cloud that guided them in their path. And at night, there was a pillar of fire, so they'd know exactly where to go. Long before GPS, God had a way of getting his people around. They had also seen the Pharaoh come and try to run them down with his army of chariots and, and, and captured them and thought they had them pinned at the Red Sea. But then they saw God open up that Red Sea. But not only open up that Red Sea, blew uh, air through there, dried up the land so they could walk across on hard surface. And when they got to the other side, what did God do? As those chariots came rumbling after him, God brought that Red Sea right on top of them. He saw them deliver them. But not only that, every morning God fed them breakfast with manna. And at night God had quail come flying through about knee high. Everybody just grabbed, got a net and just kind of caught some quail for, for supper. God was providing breakfast and supper. And uh, they really thought that, uh, that uh, this road to the promised land was going to be easy and a quick trip. It was not going to be. It was going to be a struggle. 
Now Moses has gone up to the mountain to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments and, and, to, and to learn how they were to live in God's kingdom. But in short order, the people go from praising God for His provision to rejecting God and worshiping a golden cow. Now, how in the world did that happen? How did the people see the miracles of God and then reject Him totally only in a matter of days? The answer is one simple word, fear. They began to be afraid. And fear leads to a hard heart. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, it says, When the people saw Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. In the message translation, it says it a little easier. It says, They rallied around Aaron and said, Do something. Make us gods for us to lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what happened to him? They wanted something they could see. Moses was out of sight for a few days, and the people got what? They got scared. I heard somebody say they got like henless chickens. They panicked. They didn't know what to do. And God was shocked at how these people who he had just delivered were now gone to full-fledged calf praising. They had a wild service praising this calf. Now, in Exodus chapter 32, verses 7 through 9, God says, the Lord said to Moses, Go down, go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. He said, I've seen these people, God says, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. And so he sent him on down. He said their hearts became hard toward God. And, uh, and one thing I want you to note is that fear is not something that, uh, that upset God. God is not concerned when we're afraid. In fact, fear is a natural thing. In fact, if you don't feel a little bit afraid, there's something wrong with you. My dad loved John Wayne. And uh, John Wayne, cowboy hero and all that good stuff, he used to say there's nothing wrong with being afraid. In fact, courage is not not being afraid. Courage is when you're afraid and you saddle up anyway. You go to it anyway. Fear is something to have. And God was not concerned that they felt fear. God was concerned about their reaction and response to fear. In fact, you remember that disease, that FOP, that calcification disease, what is it? It's an overreaction to something that's happening in your body. It's an abnormal reaction. And when we ab respond abnormally to fear, then bad things happen. Now their response, they didn't turn to God. They didn't trust Him. I guess they thought God had not won their trust. He freed them from slavery. He gave them manna every morning and quail every night. But when the tough times came, they turned away from God. And their hearts became hard to God. And instead of trusting Him, they turned away from Him and they worshipped a calf. And a lot of times when you look at things like that, you would just go, how dumb can you be? And in fact, some ways you can go, they are so dumb, that's not me. Well, a lot of times we need to realize in the Bible, those people in the Bible are us. They're just in a different time and place. If we're in the same place, we might just end up doing the same thing and reacting in a dumb way. Now, what were they doing? They were returning to what they knew where in Egypt. In fact, when times had gotten tough before, what did the people of Israel say? When they saw the chariots coming and they were stuck by the Red Sea, some of them said, what have you done? Let's go back to Egypt and let's be slaves again. They were free. They're ready to give up their freedom and go back to Egypt when they got afraid. But God parted the sea and got them out of it. Same thing is happening here. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to Egypt. And uh, in Egypt, they worshipped cows. And so that was something they thought we can do. 
Now you say, I would never do anything like that. Really? I see it all the time. Over the years, I have guided many women to the Sunshine Center. That's the organization that we help to provide Christmas to two families. And it's for abused women. And I have gotten women to them. And, uh, and uh, women that were in bad situations, threatened, abused, endangered. And what happened after they got help, they got counseling, sometimes even financial support, and a fresh start? You know what they do? Many of them I have personally known go back into abuse. Why? Because they are afraid of fear. They're afraid they can't make it on their own. And in fear, they leave freedom and a fresh start, and they return to abuse. And in fear, the people of Israel turn from God and turn back to slavery. They turn from God, and as they turned away from God, their hearts became hard toward God. The question is, what do you turn to when you turn away from God in fear? A lot of people turn to anger. To kind of, they get angry and they get mad, and I can control this situation. A lot of people turn, I know some people that turn to fast food. I just start eating something if I'm upset or scared. Some folks turn to alcohol or drugs or some kind of substance. Some people go to work. They go to work 80 hours, whatever. They just disappear. They turn to anything and everything but God. We see the power of God every day. I heard someone write, he says he sees sunsets, starry nights, immeasurable oceans, and he solves Red Sea caliber problems. And he drops blessings out of the sky, but when the pressure hits, he said, sometimes I run from God. There's a definition of a hard heart, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. I want you to look there real quick. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. In the New Testament, Paul writes to his folks in Ephesus, Galatians, Ephesians, and he writes and he says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And he talks about people that are hard-hearted to God. In futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. In another translation in the message, it says this, They are hard-hearted people. What is about them? They are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the light that God gives because they have closed their minds, hardened their hearts against Him, and they have, non they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. What are people that are hard-hearted, turned away from God? They are confused, hopefully, hopelessly confused. They have minds that are dark. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures. They practice every kind of impurity. They turn everything away from God and they turn to anything to give them escape, resources, or anything they can to find some kind of answer. In Proverbs 28, 14, Solomon writes and says, He who hardens his heart falls into trouble. And when you turn away from God, you harden your heart, you are headed for trouble. In fact, you know the number one cause or the end or ruin of marriages? It's a hard heart. Over in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, Jesus talks about divorce. And he says that Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. That was never God's plan. But he saw the cruelty and the hardness of men's hearts, and that's why he created divorce, to protect the woman because she was being abused. And that is not in God's plan and not in God's heart. They become hard. Why? Why wouldn't you become hard when you turn away from your mate? When you quit looking at them and their needs and, and who they are, and you quit talking to them and you start getting your friendship everywhere else. I knew a lot of people 
that turned away from their mates. And they may never had a physical cheating, but they had emotional cheating. They gave their hearts to people at the office and other places, but they quit giving their heart to their mate, and they became hard and cruel and mean to them. Hard hearts turn away from God. They turn away from God. I heard of a great illustration of this, a lady by the name of Karen Hill. And uh, she wrote a little story about the, the can-nosed cow. Now, I, I love being outside. And as a Boy Scout, I went everywhere. But, but I, I never did anything on a farm, you know. The only farming I did was my dad's backyard, you know. But I had a friend named Kurt Miller. And I remember when we were in college, if anybody would say, you want to go somewhere, we all went. And so Kurt had a, uh, uh, an uncle in Oklahoma. And so he said, you want to go to my uncle's, you know, ranch? And so we said, sure. So we went out to his farm and to his ranch. And, uh, and I discovered a couple of things. One is that I discovered that uh, cows are expensive. I mean, I couldn't believe how much he paid for the cattle that he had. They were just a fortune. And they got this one calf, and the calf cost a fortune. And they lost it. How do you lose a calf? Well, they had a field out there, and the grass was like this high, and the cow was in it. And the cow left him one day, and they couldn't find it. And so before we left, after they fed us, they said, you have to do one last thing. And they put us out in the field, and he was far apart from each other. And you said, you keep yelling and running and, and until finally we get this cow out of here. And sure enough, at the last minute, all of a sudden, the cow just popped out of the grass, and, and then we could go home. But cows are important. But this lady, uh, uh, Karen Hill, had this very special cow, and someone had thrown something out where the cow was. I don't know what it was, a coffee can, some kind of can, but the cow went up to it and stuck his nose in it to see what it was, and the can got stuck on his nose. And so when you got a can stuck on your nose, you can't eat, you can, you know, maybe a little air from the sides, but you got a problem. And so she saw that, and so I'll take care of it. She walked up to the cow, and the cow was panicked because it had this can on its head, and so it ran away from her. And so she spent three days trying to catch that cow. And after three days, that cow's in bad shape. The cow hadn't drank, hasn't eaten in three days, and she's in a panic. This is a precious cow, cost a fortune. And what in the world could she do? She's chased it down. She's run it down. She's tried to do everything, but the cow keeps running away from her. Finally, she called out to all her neighbors, and they all came out in this big old field, and they got trucks, and they got ropes, and after spending half the day, they rounded up that cow, and then somebody went up, and after they got it, and they pulled that can, decanned that cow, and saved his life. He ran away and away. When you turn away from God, you can get yourselves in all kinds of trouble. Maybe you can even get a can stuck on your head. The question you have to ask yourself is when are you going to quit running from God? Because that's how you get a hard heart, when you run away from God. Because God wants to do what? He wants to catch you. He wants to receive you. He want, doesn't want you to starve. He doesn't want you to struggle. He wants to love you. But you have to let him catch you. If you keep on running like that cow, you're in deep trouble. That's how people's hearts become hard. But the cure for a hard heart is very simple, and that's just simply turning back to God. That passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. He gave his son to us that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You need to receive him. And why do you do that? One of the ways that we receive him is we think about what he's done. We remember what God has done for us. Remember what God has done for us. You know, we're all very short-sighted. I was looking over in Mark chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, and the disciples were sitting around talking, and, um, and, and they brought up only having one loaf of bread and, uh, in the conversation. And Jesus looked at them and just kind of stared at them and said, What on earth is wrong with y'all? And, and why? Because he had just previously done two things. One, he had fed 4,000 people. And when he fed the 4,000 people, it says there were seven baskets of food left. And then he fed 5,000 people, the one we always go to. And there were 12 baskets of food left. Jesus had fed 4,000 people and 12,000 people. 
And the disciples are going, we just got one loaf. What is wrong with y'all? Jesus said, can you not remember? Can you not remember? And we do that all the time. We forget what God has done to us. We need to make a catalog of all that God has done for us. You know, every morning when I get up, my blessings walk past me. Jackie walks past me. Little old Bentley and those little feet walk past me. People walk past me. They are the blessings in my life. We need to remember what God has done. I remember uh, th this last summer was, uh, there's no anniversaries. You don't do anniversaries of death. But it had been 10 years since my dad died. And uh, toward the end of his life, I'm not always sure dad, my dad knew who I was. But you know what? That never changes anything because I knew who, what he was to me and what he did for me. And sometimes I just pause and I remember who he was and what he did and what a blessing he was to my life. We need to do that for God all the time. We need to stop and think what God has done for you and what he has provided for you. When you do that, you want to be around him. You want to talk to him. You want to thank him. And we need to also acknowledge what we have done. What we have done. Over in 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, it says this. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. We say God's a liar. And his word has no place in our lives. I remember a friend of mine used to always pray and begin his prayers. Dear Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. And I remember a lot of times looking at him going, forgive you for what? He was a great guy. You know, he hadn't done anything. Well, he knows what he's done. And you know what you've done. And I know what I've done. And every prayer ought to begin just in that way. God, forgive me. We need to admit our sins before him. In fact, the Bible tells us if we hoard our sins, if we don't own up to them and talk to God about them, it stiffens us. It stiffens us to God. It pre puts a barrier between us and God. It's something there. It's just like your parents. I don't know about you and me, but uh, when I was growing up, if I did something wrong or I did something I wasn't supposed to do, you know, I'd hide it. I remember it was three months before my parents saw one report card I had. Finally had to own up. And, uh, and uh, I had to do better the next time. And uh, you know what? But when I did that, you know what? Every time I passed them, I felt odd. I felt like I'm hiding something. I didn't feel open. I didn't feel the communication like it should. And that's how it is with us and God. And a lot of times we think there's nothing wrong in my life. Oh, yes, there is. There's so much God needs to do and wants to do in your life. And you need to take that to him and confess it to him. And when you do, God is gracious and God is forgiving and God is loving. When it comes to sin, there's always an option. There's repentance or there's judgment. Back in Exodus 32, verse 26, Moses stood before the people and he saw what they'd done and he said very simply, you need to make a choice. If you are for the Lord, come stand with me. Make a choice. Well, on that day, a bunch of people come and stood with him, but in chapter 32, verse 28, about 3,000 didn't. And you know what happened? They died. That was it. You had a chance to stand with God even though you were a sinner or you could die. Those who refuse to repent are plagued. You know, when you're a little kid, you played with Play-Doh, didn't you? And if you're like me, you didn't get new ones all the time. You got the same old Play-Doh. It lasted for years. Sometimes you go in, you drop it out of the can, and, and this is like a rock. But you know, if you just keep working on it after a while, it becomes flexible. And that's how we are with God. If we do some more time we spend with Him, we become pliable to His will and to what He longs to have for us. The question is, your heart hard? Take it to your Father. You're only a prayer away from tenderness. You live in a hard world. You don't need to live in a life. You don't need to live a life with a hard heart toward God. You know, um, one of the greatest things about God is His compassion and His love for each and every one of us. Uh, I found a thing on the radio the other day. We got a free thing when we got our car. And uh, 
Um, we got extra radio channels for a while. I don't think I'll keep it, but, uh, but I noticed there's a whole bunch of stuff, a bunch of weird stuff on there, but there's Billy Graham thing on there. And you can listen to Billy Graham sermons 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so sometimes, I don't find anything else, I'll listen to Billy. And uh, I remember he was telling a story. And um, uh, a song came out when I was a teenager based on that story. It's been told in many different ways. What was it? Uh, Tony Orlando and Dawn. Tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. Heard that song. Well, there's a lot of different stories. Billy Graham, this, this, well, he was preaching back in the 50s. This story, he said the story's been told many ways, but he says he believes this is the original story and the way that it really goes. And he says a man was in prison. He'd been there for seven years, and his time was up, and they were letting him out. He was going home. And he had been kind of estranged from his family. And, uh, and he came his time out, and he realized, I've got to go somewhere. And he was thinking about, can I go home? And he began to think in his mind, I know they're ashamed of me. After all this time, I know what I've done, and I'm ashamed of myself. And he said, I can't imagine they could forgive me. So he wrote a letter to him, and he said, listen, I'm, I'm getting out of prison, and I'm coming home, but I understand if you don't want me to be there. And so unlike the story, he didn't say tie a yellow ribbon. He said, if you want me to come home, the bus that I'm taking home I know passes by our house, and there's a tree out there. And I know you got a yellow sheet or something. Just tie a yellow sheet if you want me to come, and I'll get off the bus. And if not, he said, I know I don't deserve it. And so I'll just go on, and I'll go farther down the line, and I'll find a job somewhere. So he got on that bus, and he was heading home. And about the last stop, all these high college kids got on. They were heading back to class. When I was in college, I took the bus a few times. It's terrible. But anyway, he got on the bus, and they're all yakking and stuff. And they went up to this man, just talking, talking, talking. And they said, where are you going? And he said, I don't know. And he said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, it depends. He said, it depends on what? And so finally, he, he told him his story. And so they, they don't just talk among themselves, teenagers or whatever they are, they all talk in one. And so they all knew the story in 10 minutes. And so they knew it was coming up in the next town. And so they all leaning forward, looking and looking and looking, seeing if it's there. And as he pulls around the corner and you see the tree at a distance, there's not just one sheet up there. There's every sheet and every pillowcase and everything they could find is tied to that tree. But not only that, his house is covered up in everything that you could see. The kids all cheer, and they let him off, and he goes home. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? Jesus said when the prodigal son comes home, when those that are lost, those that are sinners, come home to God, what happens in heaven? They cheer. They cheer for what? They cheer for you. We live in a world that's hopeless, but we have a God that has endless hope. And when our heart becomes hard, if we just turn back to Him, He will run to see us. And we can have a new and a better life. Isn't that the message our world needs to hear? Our message in our world doesn't need to hear any more politics and anything else. They need Jesus, because Jesus is their only hope. If your heart is hard today, if your heart is hard today, it doesn't have to be. You just have to turn to him, and he'll make everything different. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much that you love us. And Lord, you're the picture of love. You're what love is all about. And whatever we know about love and how to act about love, it's because we know you. And Lord, if there's anyone distant from you today, let them open their heart and receive you. And Lord, if there's anyone who needs you as Savior, let them receive you as Savior. And anybody that needs to take a new step of faith, let them do that today. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. We have time of invitation, time to sing before the Lord. If you have a prayer request, like to come forward, make a decision, receive Jesus, join our fellowship. If God's speaking your heart in any way, come and join us. We're going to sing 321, The Savior is Waiting. Join us in standing as we sing together, 321. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let
Bless y'all. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Miss Linda, for playing. That was great. Gentlemen, if you did not get a book, please come and get one. We want you to have one. And uh, remember tonight, we'll meet at 4 o'clock for this time only for our biblical, I mean, uh, uh, biblical justice. Glad to have you join us in that. All right, our, our closing hymn is 359. This is the day, and this is the day to live for the Lord. 359. This is a day, this is a day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is a day.